Today we're looking at the church's power to restrain Satan's kingdom. Now, let's start by establishing what do we mean by church. Uh, we're not talking about a denomination. We're not talking about some religious institution. We're talking about the body of Christ that is made up of genuine, born-again converts. Now, we have seen that uh, there are two extremes to be avoided. On one extreme, there's this widespread tendency to ignore the enemy and treat the whole subject of demonology as an irrelevant fantasy that my life has no connection to. Um, the other extreme is to engage in a fearful preoccupation with Satan. Uh, this is a position that usually takes uh, the attitude that all of life's difficulties are, are to be attributed to the devil and uh, where I spend my time rebuking him, casting him out, and continually attempting to bind him, so on and so forth. Those are two extremes to be avoided. And then there's an invisible realm to be noted. Uh, as we've said before, there are many church people who just ignore the subject altogether, and that is because it concerns something that is entirely invisible to the naked eye. However, 2 Corinthians 4.18 says that believers are to fix their eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Um, alas, as I just said, most believers are preoccupied with what is temporary, as can be evaluated by what we pray about. And we'll pray for our loved ones to get out of a d d difficulty, to be delivered from a trial, unlike the Apostle Paul, who only prayed for believers to be strengthened by the trial or, or to have a great, greater revelation of Jesus Christ through the trial. Paul Azel said, if in, if in a retrospective assessment of a person's prayer life, it be discovered that he or she is never concerned with anything beyond what affects them in the visible realm, one wonders what it will take for them to be ever concerned with the true purpose of prayer, which is ushering in the kingdom of God an exercise that lies entirely in the invisible spiritual realm. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus says, you cannot see the kingdom of God at all unless you are born again. And then five verses later, in verse 8, John 3, 8, he tells us, and even after that, you, you're not going to be able to visibly see the spiritual kingdom. And that's because, he says, the Holy Spirit is like the wind which blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it's coming from or where it's going. As been, has been said many, many times, uh, uh, the, you can't see the wind, but you can certainly see the effects of the wind. It is only with the eyes of faith, seeing what God has revealed in Scripture, that you can truly behold the spiritual kingdom of God. And of course, likewise, you cannot see Satan, you, 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 you cannot perceive anything about his kingdom, but of course, you can observe the appalling destruction that, that leaves a black smoking trail behind him. Um, and again, of course, the eyes of faith are required to see what God has revealed so that the kingdom of darkness can be truly brought to light. So there's two extremes to be avoided. There's an invisible realm to be noted, and there's an enemy whose force is very potent. And may I say, before we begin, um, discussing the power of Satan. We, we have to remind ourselves from Job chapter 1, verse 9 to 12, and also from Luke 22, verse 31, that Satan has absolutely no power whatsoever to do anything ever except by God's permission. That We have to understand it. But having been given permission to do so, he can influence a person's thought life. Acts 5.3, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? I'll give an example of that. Job 1.15 makes it absolutely clear that Satan moved the army of the Sabaeans to rob Job of his property. Stunning. Uh, so he can influence your thought life. He can influence people's dreams and give them lying visions. Zechariah 10 verse 2 says diviners see visions that lie. They tell dreams that are false. In Jeremiah 23, 25, 
God says, I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? Now, maybe they even thought they were speaking for God, but they're speaking the delusions of their own mind. And this is, of course, a profound reminder that our faith must be based entirely on God's word, not on our experience, and certainly not on our feelings as we have processed them. Satan can influence your thought life. He can influence your dreams. He can cause people great anxiety. First uh, Samuel 16, 14 to 23, and 2 Timothy 1, 7, it talks about a spirit of fear. Well, it's certainly not a holy spirit of fear. It's an evil spirit of fear. You know that 10 million Americans are, have a diagnosed phobia. And that's stunning. Everything from dextrophobia, which is a fear of something terrible happening to me on the right side of my body, to isotrophia, which is a fear of mirrors. Um, I possess that one. <laughs> uh, Isaiah 61 verse 3 doesn't only talk about a spirit of fear, but talks about a spirit of heaviness. And according to Anxiety and Depression Association of America, that seems like a, a good resource, uh, 40 million Americans have an anxiety disorder. And if you can believe it, depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States between the ages of 15 and 45. Satan can influence your thought life. He can influence your dreams. He can give you unreasonable anxiety. Satan can even cause people to become physically sick. You say, really? Really? Uh, Luke 13, verse 10 says, On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Now, if you know the story... Jesus heals her, and the synagogue ruler is incensed because, of course, he did it on the Sabbath day. Verse 15, the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath for what bound her? Now, of course, somebody's going to say, Yeah, but, you know, in those days, <clears throat> they, they saw every sickness as satanic. You know, if, if you had a seizure, well, there, yeah, you see, the person's demon-possessed. This is not the case. Matthew 4.24. News about Jesus spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering from severe pain, from demon possession, those having seizures, that's a different category, and the paralyzed. And he healed them. Now, we can see in Scripture that there were cases where people who had uh, a demon, um, they also, Matthew 17, they had uh, seizures, but, but they understood these as being two different things. Now, Satan can also raise up people and arrange circumstances to oppose what it is you're trying to do for God. 1 Thessalonians 2.18, the apostle says, For we wanted to come to you, certainly I polled it again and again, but Satan hindered us. How about that? Uh, did you know that Satan can affect the weather? Profoundly so. Remember, it's always by permission. Job chapter 1, verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything Job has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So, don't need to tell you what, it, you just, what I just read, but I will. And that is that he, he, he told Satan, you're not allowed to touch this man, but you can have everything he owns. And what happened next? Verse 19, we read that suddenly a mighty wind swept from the desert and struck the four corners of the house and it collapsed on Job's children and they died. Now, such scriptures are dramatic departures from the weak theology that is taught in many churches, that basically assumes that everything pleasant comes from God and everything that is unpleasant comes from Satan. It, it's a view that uh, 
essentially takes the position that, that God loses all the battles, because he certainly appears to be doing so, but somehow, miraculously, he wins the war. This is, uh, this is not a good position to hold. It's certainly not a biblical one. He can cause people to be physically sick. He can affect the weather, given permission. Satan can even, with permission, possess people to the point that he has total control of them. In, indeed, he can even speak through them. And if you want to see an example of that, you can turn to Matthew 8, 28. Satan can produce counterfeit miracles. You may remember back uh, very early in the Old Testament that Pharaoh's magicians were able to mimic the plague of frogs. Um, that's the plague, of course, that God accomplished through Moses. And they were even able to turn water into blood. You know what's really interesting is Jesus called Satan Beelzebub, which is the Lord of the Flies. But when Pharaoh's magicians tried to imitate the plague of gnats, which is essentially the plague of flies, they couldn't do it. And they went to Pharaoh and they said, this, though, happens to be, must be the finger of God. I, I don't really know what to make of that, but I'll tell you one thing we can extract from it, and that is that Satan can't produce or hurt a fly unless God gives him permission to do so. Uh, but if he does give him permission to do so, he can perform counterfeit miracles. Speaking of the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2.9 says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. And if you want to know the 11th verse, assures us that it is God himself who raises up the Antichrist for his own purposes. I suppose above all, uh, Satan is a liar, John 8, 44, and he is also a profound deceiver, 2 Corinthians eleven three. He's a real foe, and Ephesians 6, 11 tells church people, I mean God's people, to take your stand against the devil's schemes. <clears throat> So what is, excuse me, <clears throat> what is Satan's great objective? We briefly mentioned it, but it's to receive universal worship by, by gaining po political control through a leader of a one world government known as the Antichrist, who will demand the whole world to worship him and will execute extreme hostility against anyone who refuses to do so. God has two plans to deal with Satan. And both of them are to be carried out by the church. First of all, as we looked and spent a whole Sunday looking at, uh, the, as the fact that the battlefront is the truth and over the truth, we are to display and to proclaim God's truth in the natural realm. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says we are to spread the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, resulting in the gathering in of God's elect. But we're also to display and proclaim God's truth in the supernatural realm. Ephesians 3.10 tells us that it was his intent now that through the church, that is the body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Uh, after all, 1 Timothy 3.15 says the church is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Okay, so first of all, the believer or the the real church is to display and proclaim God's truth in the natural realm and before the supernatural realm. And secondly, through obedience to the truth, living according to the truth, we are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world and thereby usher in the kingdom of God. It is vital to understand that Satan is a defeated foe. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, Christ too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of the death, of death, that is the devil. So Satan is a defeated foe. I mean, all you've got to do is read the four Gospels and, and you will see Satan and his demons repeatedly cowering before Jesus as any defeated foe would cower before, before their conqueror. He's a defeated foe. Uh, in fact, he's so powerless before God uh, 
that Jesus says in Luke 11, verse 20, that he casts out Satan by the finger of God. He's defeated. Colossians 2.15 says, And having disarmed Satan's powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, notice, having disarmed Satan's powers and authorities, Satan has been disarmed. Now, here lies and arises one of the great problems at least intellectual problems in theology. And that is, why didn't God just wipe out the devil and all of his human enemies off the face of the earth? Just wipe them out. Why did he only choose to disarm Satan? Well, uh, I'll make a stab at it. As far as all human enemies of God are concerned, <clears throat> if you look in the parable of the weeds, you may remember that God's children are seen as wheat growing in a field, whereas unbelievers are portrayed as weeds. This is the text. God's servants asked him, did you want us to go and pull them up? No, that's God's answer. Because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Now, I think had God wiped off the face of the earth those who wanted nothing to do with him in 1977, I'd have never been saved because I didn't want anything to do with God until he got a hold of me in 1978. You think, well, okay, well, that, this some, makes some sense, but, but why, why did God only disarm Satan? Well, obviously this is a question that requires and deserves a very in-depth response that we can't do. But here's the easy answer, uh, which we've given to a number of difficult questions because we, the sermon was not on that topic. And that's Ephesians 1.11, is God works out everything to conform to the purpose of his will. Uh, of course, not his moral will, hardly anything conforms to his moral will, but his sovereign will, to his purposes. And, and of course, one could add to that, that it is both observable and remarkable that God has ordained that that his children also be involved in the destruction of Satan, in spiritual warfare. There's an old English comedian by the name of Spike Milligan, and he wrote an autobiography that concerned his war years, and he called it Hitler, my part in his downfall. Well, God has ordained that all believers have a part in Satan's downfall. This is just the way God wanted to do it. Consequently, believers have been given the power to restrain Satan's kingdom. Now, what is it? Let's look at our passage in Matthew 5, 13. Jesus says here, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Okay, so why salt? Um, uh, what is salt? Well, you probably know that the scientific name for salt is sodium chloride. Uh, Webster's Dictionary says it's a crystalline substance used for seasoning and preserving food. So salt primarily does two things. First of all, it makes things seasoned, and that is acceptable to the palate that would otherwise not be acceptable. Number two, it has the ability to restrain the process of corruption. Well, as the battle is over the truth, the believer, by dispersing the truth and living according to the truth, has the power to restrain Satan's kingdom and, first of all, to make acceptable to God that which, without the believer's presence, would not be acceptable to God. And secondly, they, he has and she has the power to restrain the process of corruption. Remembering, of course, that the power is in the truth, and the only reason the power is in the believer is because the truth is in the believer. Psalm 106, verse 20 to 23. And this is speaking of a time when Israel was in the wilderness and was committing idolatry as it worshipped the golden calf. And Psalm 106 says, They exchanged their glory for an image of a bull which eats grass 
They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. So God said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to keep his wrath from destroying them. Look at that. One grain of salt saved a nation of people. And how did he do it? By making them acceptable to God when otherwise they would not have been acceptable to God. In Ezekiel 22 verse 30, God is actually looking for a grain of salt because Jerusalem is on the verge of judgment. And God said, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them in my fiery anger, bringing down on their heads all that they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. You go over to the New Testament, Acts 27, and you see that Paul is on a ship going to Rome. He encounters a fearful storm and the storm is so severe that the text says when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging we finally gave up all hope of being saved after that uh, after sorry the men had gone a long time without food paul stood up before them and said i urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost only the ship will be destroyed you see, last night an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You, you must stand before Caesar. And so God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. One grain of salt preserved the lives of everyone on board. And now, of course, somebody's going to say, Well, yeah, yeah, but that's because that's the great apostle Paul. Not what the text says. Paul identifies his relationship to God by speaking about the God whose I am and whom I serve. So the text makes it really clear that it wasn't because he was an apostle that the lives of everyone on board were preserved. It was because first he belonged to God and secondly he served God. Now when you look around the world today, if you're over 30 years of age, you will note a massive increase in corruption. What's going on with this catastrophic, uh, mindless, stupid mental processes that are so sinfully expressing themselves in the public arena? And you say, what's the problem? Who's to blame? Is it the government? Is it a particular government? And the Word of God says, no, it's the church. The church is abandoning the truth. The church, instead of preaching the atonement, instead of preaching forgiveness, instead of preaching sin, man's depravity, and God's amazing grace, they're teaching self-help sermons. They're, 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 you can go to their church and every Sunday you'll have a positive affirmation sermon to get you through the week. It's abandoning the truth. And if that wasn't enough, of course, the church is trying to be as much like the world that, that it could possibly be uh, so that it will become more relevant. And perhaps more relevant to the world it is becoming, but increasingly irrelevant when it comes to possessing the ability to change the world or preserve it from further corruption. As Jesus said, the salt has lost its savor. Basil Eden said, thousands regularly meet together at church, but their lives don't impact anyone for Christ when they leave their gathering. Well, 65,000 people don't pay $150 a ticket to see the Miami Dolphins huddle. Good point. Acts chapter 8 says, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, but salt in the shaker doesn't scare Satan. It doesn't cause him, as Spurgeon once said, to tremble in his palace of flame. It is only when the salt is poured out that evil is restrained. Salt adds, of course, flavor to food, and the joyous flavor of a believer's hope or can be used by God to draw people to Christ. Uh, that's the way it should work. 
uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen that I had been exposed to had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Uh, salt doesn't just add flavor to the food, of course it makes people thirsty. And uh, there again you have it, that salt can be, uh, salty believers can be used by God in order to give people a thirst for Christ. There's another thing about salt, and that is salt can be, can, can really hurt. It can really sting if it gets into a wound. And you see, salty believers, they don't water down the truth so that it doesn't sting. Rather, they speak the truth in love. Let me just say one more interesting thing about salt when you do a little research on it is that sodium is a very inoffensive and actually rather pleasant substance, especially if you have it in a Diet Coke. Um, whereas chlorine is a poisonous gas that has a very offensive odor. But when you put sodium and chloride together, sodium chloride becomes salt. Well, God's love without God's truth is very inoffensive. But of course, it's as worthless as unbeneficial to your health as a Diet Coke. Now, if you reverse that, God's truth without God's love is an obnoxious, poisonous gas that can and will only condemn. But when you put them together, it can and it does become life-changing and believers become the very agent that has the power to restrain Satan's kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, um,